Masechet Nedarim, Daf Lamed Chet. We began with a fascinating series of Agadot, and then we're going to get to the next Mishnah, which is about giving benefit to someone else's family members and animals. So we were speaking about re- receiving compensation for teaching Torah, uh, which generally is prohibited. We said the reason is because just as Hashem taught Moshe the Torah, for free, and so too Moshe taught Bnei Israel also for free. They did not ask for compensation. Uh, Torah is free uh, for all to receive, and that's why even today uh, it's uh, problematic for anyone to receive compensation for teaching Torah. The only exception would be in some places where they teach uh, only Mikra, and that also only because it's children, and so uh, it's really for babysitting services or just for teaching the tunes of the Tamim, but for um, teaching essential Torah would be prohibited. Okay, so once we're on that topic, we're going to talk about Moshe and his wealth, how he get, got wealthy. We know it says Moshe, Moshe she said, I never received anything from you. So here we go. Moshe did not get rich only by the remains of the uh, luchot that he broke, uh, meaning he did not, he never took any compensation or any gifts or any bribes or any salary from anybody else. But the um, the broken luchot were made on valuable material, and he was able to um, uh, benefit financially from those. Shene emar pesol lecha shene luchot avanim kari shonim pesotan shelecha yehe. And the instruction of Hashem to go and hew two new uh, tablets like the first ones. So uh, making a play on words, uh, the word pesol, which means to you also can mean the broken pieces. And so pesol, the broken pieces of the first luchot, lecha, are yours. And therefore you can keep them and they're made of valuable gems. And so Moshe was able to uh, become rich through those. Okay, very interesting. Pesol lecha, ma pesotan shelecha, af ketavan shelecha. And now we're going to make a comparison between this pesol lecha and another lecha uh, uh, verb uh, that uh, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yosef says, the Torah originally was all Hashem gave it only to Moshe and his two Moshe's children. That's it only to him, not to all of Bnei Israel. As it says, ketov lecha, write down the Torah for yourself. Now, grammatically, the word lecha is simply emphasizing the second person uh, of the uh, of the verb sivui uh, verb ketob ketob lecha. Um, but since it's an extra word, it could just say ketov. So the word lecha, the rabbis in midrash like to say that this is yours or for you. And so, just like pesol lecha means that. The remains of the broken luchot are yours. So too, it means uh, when it's, when Hashem says, "Write down the Torah," it means it's yours. It's only yours. You don't have to share with anybody else. You could just give it to your children, and uh, their and their descendants after them. However, Moshe Nahagba Tobat Ayin Untanal Yisrael Alava Katuv Amer Tob Ayin Hu Yevorach. But Moshe decided. He's going to be generous and he's going to share it with all of Israel. And this Pasuk says in Mishle that Tov Ayin, someone who is generous, has a good eye, he will be blessed. And Moshe was blessed for that. All right, where's Midrash actually getting this from? Well, um, Hashem did, in fact, offer to Moshe after Chet Egel, he says, I'm going to wipe out the rest of the nation and you will be the father of a new nation. So you and your children. So actually, there is, uh, there is a Peshat aspect to this Midrash. It was offered to Moshe to give him the Torah only, uh, but Moshe was generous and he said, no, if uh, I'm, I'm out, take me out of your book if you're going to do that. And uh, therefore insisted on, on sharing the Torah with all of Bnei Israel. But now we have a challenge. Rav Chista challenges this teaching. Is that how can you say that Moshe only was offered the Torah and he didn't have to share it? Uh, doesn't it say here, Oti Siva Lelamed Etchem? Right? Moshe himself says, Hashem commanded me in order to teach you, you all Bnei Israel. So obviously, doesn't that mean that Moshe did have to share it with everybody? 
And then we answer, no, not necessarily. You can read it as follows. Oti siva, Hashem commanded it to me, to me only. And then ve'ani lachem. Then I decided, you know what, I'll teach it to, I'll teach it to you. So the first of the pasuk is, is, the, is what Hashem had in mind. Oti siva, I was just going to be mean, just going to be mine. But then I decided, lelamed etchem, because I'm generous. Okay, another challenge. Look at this pasuk. It says, uh, Moshe tells B'nai Israel, see how um, uh, I taught you today, Chukim and Mishpatim, as Hashem commanded me. Doesn't that mean that Hashem commanded me to teach you, right? And so I had to teach it to you? And that would be a challenge to the previous uh, um, understanding. And we say, no, here also, Oti Siva Vani Lachem. No, Kashe Sivani is Hashem uh, commanded me with the Mitzvot, me only. I could have kept them just for myself and my family. But I decided, Limaditi, I decided that I want to be generous and teach it to all of you. Okay, good. So we solve, we solve that Pasuk. Another one, Ve'ata Kitvu Lachem et HaShira Hazot, referring to the Shira of Ha'azinu, right before that. Um, uh, Hashem says, now go and write down this song. So this, this song, doesn't that mean the entire Torah? Isn't that all referring to the, the whole Torah? And therefore you see Hashem is, is commanding Moshe to teach B'nai Israel all of the Torah, referred to as a Shira. And we answer, no, not necessarily. It could be Hashira Lechuda, maybe only Shira Ta'azinu. That was the public uh, poem that he was to teach everyone. But the rest of the Torah, he could have kept for himself. Okay, last challenge. Uh, but this should be, this song will be, an Ed will be a witness for to B'nai Israel. So if this is going to be a witness, that means, we presume it means a witness to the entire Torah. So the word Shira that you're going to write down, and that Shira is going to be a witness of the Berit, is referring to the whole Torah, because you need the whole Torah to be, um, uh, to, to be part of that Berit and to be a witness. And therefore the conclusion is that um, this Pasuk Yitvu Lachem et Shira is not referring only to Azinu. In fact, the whole Torah is called a Shira, which itself is interesting. Maybe it references back to the, the, the song of the Ta'amim, and maybe that's one of the reasons why it's actually essential uh, to learn the Torah with Ta'amim, because the whole Torah is called a Shira here. Um, but in any case, um, now we have given up on, well, on, on the, um, uh, this is a solid proof, rejecting uh, the understanding that we had, we had before. In fact, all of the Misvot, the entire contents of the Torah, was in fact given to Moshe, for the entire uh, Bnei Israel, Moshe was, it was not taught as a private, only for only for Moshe and his um, own family. So rather, what what does that refer to when we said that Moshe, this is only for you, Ketov Lecha? That was referring to not the basic essence of Torah, but rather pilpula be'alma, other um, uh, extra credit, uh, the things that you can derive one thing from another from the basic from these basic laws that Moshe was taught. So that Moshe was given some extra pilpul, um, uh, extra uh, desserts, uh, interesting items, and Moshe could have kept those teachings to himself. But Moshe was generous even in those. But of course, the basic laws of Torah, certainly he had to teach all of Bnei Israel. Okay, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Ena Kadosh Baruch Hu Mashre Shechina Toela Al Gibor VeAshir VeChacham VeAnav VeChulan MiMoshe. Rabbi Yochanan says that Hashem uh, where, um, uh, uh, allows His Shechina to rest only, meaning to give prophecy. Uh, in order to be a prophet, you need the following character character traits, a gibor to be mighty and to be rich. This is probably why it's this is meant here, brought here, because we just talked about that a teacher cannot become rich by teaching, but Moshe got rich from the um, from the broken luchot. So this is a, a necessary uh, prerequisite and also has to be wise and humble. And we learned all of them from Moshe. Now let's see how Moshe had all of these character traits. Number one, gibor. He has to be physically strong. And the Pasuk says that Moshe, sounds like himself, maybe in Peshat it means he had help and he was directing traffic. But uh, in the simple literal meaning, it says that Moshe himself uh, covered, uh, spread over the, spread the tent over the Mishkan. Now the Mishkan was quite tall. 
ואמר מור משה רבנו פרסו וכתיב עשר אמות אורך הקדש. Right, the master said that Moshe uh, did the spreading of the, uh, of the covering by himself, and you have to remember that the length of each board was 10 cubits. 10 cubits, that's over 15 feet. So that means the walls of the Mishkan were over 15 feet, and you had to take the curtains and the, the covering and uh, spread it on top and go all the way to the other side. So you had to be really strong and big in order to do that. So the Wis and Moshe did that. Obviously, he was physically, must have been very big and strong, right? Well, we said not necessarily. Emma Darich Vikatin. He just has to actually have to be tall, very tall uh, in order to reach that high. But he could have been tall and thin, kind of uh, lanky. Mm, doesn't mean he was actually very strong. It wasn't that heavy to carry those curtains and uh, throw them to the other side. So this is not a good proof. Rather, as from the Basuk described, when Moshe himself describes that, he took hold of the two tablets and he threw them from his hands and broke them. He smashed them. This would take a lot of strength because look how big they were. The Luchot were six by six by three hand breaths, right? So about, you know, three inches, so 18 by 18 by 9. So uh, sometimes we think of the Luchot as um, uh, in paintings, like, you know, uh, being somewhat thin, like the Flintstones newspaper. Um, but actually, according to this, they were big blocks of, of, of stone, heavy material, and to not only be able to carry them, but also to lift them up and, and throw them hard enough that they smash into pieces, that shows that he was, Moshe was, uh, in fact, physically very strong. Good. Ashir pesolecha pesotan shelecha yeheh. He was rich. We already established that because he was able to uh, keep the uh, the broken tablets. Because his pesol, the or the broken pieces are for you. Chacham, Rav Shmuel Damarat Tarvayhu, Chamishim Shari Bina Nivru Ba'olam, Cholam Nitenul Moshe. Haserachat. We know that Moshe was wise, um, just an intellectual knowledge, because. Uh, Rav and Shemuel said that there are 50 gates of, of wisdom in, uh, that the world uh, that would, are created in the world. So that's the highest level will be 50. And all of them were given to Moshe except one. Moshe got to level 49. How do we know that? In Mizmor 8, it says Hashem uh, made man a little lower than, than, uh, than God himself. And so if the ultimate possible is 50 that would that would be God himself knows 50 and so Moshe the highest human is a little lower than that so Moshe got 49 so certainly that's called wise Anav ish Moshe Anav Me'od Anav is so easy that's an explicit pasuk that Moshe was Anav good so Moshe had all the qualities now, based on that, we're gonna um, we're going to learn about other neviim. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Kol neviim Ashirim Hayu. In fact, all the neviim had to be rich. Min Elan, Mi Moshe, Umi Shemuel, Me Amos, Umi Mi Yona. Okay, we don't usually consider being rich to be uh, a, a, an important uh, spiritual quality. Um, but these Nevi'im, it's not only that they were receiving Hashem's message, but they also had to deliver it and convince people. And uh, so to be influential in society, it just definitely helps to be rich and certainly uh, beyond reproach, not being people that would take bribes uh, easily because they're wealthy themselves. So um, this, these were the uh, benefits uh, for the prophets for being independently wealthy. Okay, Moshe, Dichtiv, Lo Chamor Echad, Mehem Nasati. Now, we already explained that Moshe is rich, but now we're going to try another way uh, to prove it. So Moshe said uh, to the people, um, this is during the Korach rebellion, it says, I have not taken one donkey from them. Um, so if I didn't take anything from you, how can you accuse me of being uh, uh, doing this for personal gain? I, I'm here as your leader uh, for purely selfless reasons. So now, what, what does that mean that he didn't take a chamor? agra. If you mean without money, that he's he's saying I didn't steal a donkey from any of, any of you. La bela agra. So Moshe is just saying that he's excluded from the category of people who take without paying. So Moshe is just saying I'm not a thief. Like that's not a that's not a big deal. We we would expect most people should not be thieves. 
So that's nothing to boast about. What he means is that I didn't even buy, I didn't even take a, take a donkey from someone and even if I paid for it. Right? I did not forcibly, like a, a government can go and seize a property of a person and then, you know, say we're building a highway here and here's money for it. So Moshe, as a, as a, a, a leader, um, would have had the right to take something and uh, as taxes and even, and even pay for it, pay the person for it. Moshe says, I never did that. I never took a donkey, not even with payment. Okay, so that shows that why didn't he do that? Because Moshe was independently wealthy, so he didn't need anybody, uh, anybody's uh, uh, animals or materials or anything. He was uh, self-sustaining. Okay, Dilma Mishum Da'ani Hava. Hold on. Maybe he didn't take anybody's donkey, even with payment, because he was so poor that he didn't have money and couldn't afford it and didn't have much material that he needed a donkey to transport his luggage because he was so poor and didn't have anything. So it is not really a good proof. Okay, we go back to our original argument that we know he was rich because he was able to personally benefit from the broken pieces of the first Luchot. Shemuel, how do we know Shemuel was wealthy? Shemuel, in a kind of parallel statement similar to Moshe, said, here I am, uh, I'm, uh, uh, here I am, I'm, I have witnesses against me before Hashem, before his anointed, so he probably gives a promise, whose ox have I taken, whose donkey have I ever taken? So, same thing with Shemuel, does he mean that I never took it, I never took your, uh, your oxen and your donkeys by force without paying you? So is he inclu- excluding someone who just takes uh, without paying? Right, uh, uh, obviously not. Obviously, even a, a regular person, a decent person, would not take things without without um, without payment. Ela dafilu besachar, which means even with money, with, with uh, payment. Um, if he, as uh, you know, as the uh, leader of the people, maybe he would need to uh, acquire a donkey to uh, go to the next town to prophesy there. He would have had a right to commandeer one and, uh, and even give payment. I, says, I never even did that. Okay, now same question. Dilma de Anihava. No, maybe the only reason he didn't go and hire someone's donkey or buy someone's donkey is because he was so poor that he couldn't afford it and didn't need it because it had no luggage to carry. Okay, scratch that, a different proof. Um, it says Shemuel would make a circuit all around the country, go from town to town and uh, offer his uh, judging judgment services and give prophecies. And then he would return to Ramah because that is where his house was. Now, if you, ha- you don't have to say that's where his house was. Isn't that obvious that if he comes back to Ramah, he's coming back to Ramah because that's where he lives. So why do we have to say that that's where his house was? Ava explains that everywhere he went, his house was with him. Um, meaning, Sham Beto, everywhere was, was Sham Beto. He was so wealthy that his servants could, he had so many servants that they could pack all his belongings, everything he needs. He would go with 10 suitcases, and so he always felt at home everywhere he went. He had many homes, many places to stay. He brought all of his, all of his tents, all of his cosmetics, all of his wardrobe. And so he was always at home. So that's how you know he was rich. Now, since we mentioned Moshe and Shemuel, and how they both said that I never took a donkey from you, <clears throat> we're going to compare their two statements. And Ava says that Shemuel's statement is actually even greater than that of Moshe. Regarding Moshe, it only says that I did not take a donkey from you, meaning I didn't take it, certainly not for free, and I didn't, I didn't even take a donkey uh, forcibly and then pay you for it. So that's all he says. But it doesn't say that if someone offered their donkey that Moshe refused it. But regarding Shemuel, 
uh, the people respond to him and with extra words and say, uh, so we're going to Shemuel, even willingly, Shemuel, even if someone offered and said, here, take my donkey, Shemuel would not even take that, not even rent it. So certainly he would not um, uh, forcibly uh, take some, th something from someone and then pay for it. That is said by Moshe, but regarding Shemuel, he says not only would he not force someone, even if someone offered, here, take my donkey or rent my donkey, Shemuel would not do it. And we know that from the response of the people that says, you do not defraud us, nor did you oppress us. So that's Sotanu, that, that Sotanu is from Ratzon. You did not even take things when we offered it of our own goodwill with our consent. So you see that um, uh, this doesn't necessarily mean, mean that Moshe did take those things, although there would be nothing wrong with it if people are, are offering it. But uh, going Shemuel does say explicitly that, Moshe, that Shemuel refused. He didn't want to even have the appearance of having getting any favors from anyone. Okay, Amos was also rich. How do we know? Dichtiv ayan Amos vayomer el Amatzia lo navi anochi velo ben navi anochi ki boked anochi uboles shikmim. Amos said that he was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. Kidem targem Rav Yosef are mari gite ana veshikmin li bishvelta. And the targum uh, here explains that he owns flocks and he owns uh, sycamore trees in the lowland so you see he is financially independent right and his point is i didn't come to be a prophet for my own personal financial gain i was already wealthy and therefore no one can come and accuse him oh you're trying to you're trying to collect money and get get famous by um by giving prophecies. No, I don't, I don't need anybody's money. I'm doing this all the Shem Yona, how do we know Yona was wealthy? Uh, when he's running away, and he says that he paid the cost, its cost, and went uh, went down. He went he went uh, uh, um, uh, he went to the ship. Now it really should say Vaiten Sechado. He paid for his own fare. Sechada sounds like he paid for the boat. In fact, yes, he paid the cost of the whole boat. Um, uh, how much was that? It was 4,000 gold dinar, right? Huge amount. So, um, you know, he had to run away quickly, and so the boat wasn't just leaving, and so he actually, he actually had to hire out the entire boat and said, okay, I got to go fast, so, right? I'll pay for the entire boat, and uh, please sail me out of here now. Okay, obviously he was rich if he could afford that. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Batechila ya Moshe lamed Torah umeshakecha. Al sheni tena lo bematana shenemar veiten el Moshe kechaloto ledaber ito. Okay, last point Rabbi Yochanan says that at first Moshe was learning Torah, but he kept forgetting it. It's very difficult, right? He had 40 days to learn the entire Torah. He didn't have seven and a half years. And even we have seven and a half years and we still forget things. So uh, 40 days, he was trying to process, he kept forgetting until at the end, Hashem said, listen, I'm going to do you a favor. You tried very hard. I'm going to give it to you as a gift. And he just downloaded the whole thing into Moshe's memory. How do we know that? Because it says, Vayiten, Hashem gave it to him, Kechaloto, when he finished speaking with him. So he was teaching in the regular way for 40 days, but at the end, um, gave it to Moshe as a gift. Um, okay, this relates to the beginning of this of this series of Agadot, because we're talking about how um, Hashem gave the Torah to Moshe without compensation, for free, and Moshe also gave it um, over to the people, and Moshe's generosity, and this is an example of Hashem's generosity, that he would give it as a gift, right? Even um, without Moshe, certainly not having to pay for it, but not even having to work through that great difficulty of learning it all, um, but made, made it easy for him. So this is a good, um, a good lesson for a teacher is to make it as, as easy as possible for their students to remember and understand the teachings of the Torah. Even Moshe had a hard time uh, remembering everything, so we should be patient with our students as well and with ourselves. Okay, next Mishnah. Vezan et ishtov et banav af al pi shehu chayav bim zonotav. So, if I make a vow that I'm not going to give you any benefit, 
I can still, if I want, give some food to your wife or your sons, um, even though you are responsible to pay for the uh, food of your wife and, 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 and small children. And so you would think that I'm doing you a favor. Nevertheless, this is permitted because I'm not giving you the food directly, but I'm giving it to other people and they're independent beings. So even though I'm uh, taking care of uh, your responsibility by giving them food, so I'm giving them extra food, right? So they could eat a little more. That is permitted. So remember the last Mishnah right before this was that even if I can't uh, give you benefit, I have a vow, I can still teach your sons and daughters uh, Torah, right? So uh, as long as it's uh, indirect benefit, not to you, but for your, to your dependents, that's permitted. However, I cannot feed your animals, both non-kosher animals or kosher animals. That is a problem because there you are benefiting. I'm fanning up your animals and now they'll be worth more money. So that is a direct financial benefit to you. So uh, kind of ironically, right, um, I can feed your, uh, uh, um, I'm allowed to feed the human beings that are dependent upon you because they're independent human beings and you're not selling them or anything so they're they're being a little fatter is not more valuable on the market uh, but animals which are marketable things uh, therefore is a financial benefit and I cannot do that if I made a vow not to give you any benefit the Eliezer Omer Zaneta Teme'a Ve'eno Zaneta Tehora the Eliezer says the distinction between non-kosher and kosher animals. Non-kosher animals um, are permitted to, for me to feed because you're not going to eat them. You're not slaughtering them to eat them. So whereas kosher animals would not be allowed. So if I give extra food to your, uh, to your lamb, and then now the lamb is a little fatter and now when you slaughter it you'll have some more meat and then and you can sell that for more money and so that um, that would be a direct financial benefit whereas non-kosher animals why would you have non-kosher animals well uh, because you were you're working them right you might have a donkey and you use it uh, to carry things all right uh, a, a animal working on the field and so for that animal it's not really helping that i made it a little fatter uh, I'm assuming it's, we're assuming that it's getting its regular food. This is just like a little extra dessert for it to make it a bit fatter, but that doesn't make it any better, better of a worker. And you're not going to slaughter it for its meat anyway. Um, so therefore the um, non-kosher animals going to be Elias is permitted. But we have, we have a dialogue here. Amru lo, the Chachamim told Rabbi Eliezer, Ma ben teme'ale tehorai. He says, we don't understand. How can we be making a distinction between non-kosher and kosher animals. He explains here uh, what, what I just said, um, which is that the kosher animals, when its soul goes up to Shamaim, its body belongs to the owner. In other words, when it dies, then the owner has the flesh, and now if you feed it, there's more flesh. Right? If I feed it, there's more flesh, so I gave you um, physical, financial benefit. Whereas whereas a non-kosher animal, it's when its soul goes to heaven, its body also goes to heaven. It doesn't literally go to heaven. The point is that the owner is not going to have any benefit from the body. Uh, he had a work animal, it died, so now that's like his tractor uh, broke down. So it, like, it gives him no benefit if, uh, if his uh, donkey is a little bit fatter. Um, law, um, that's what Beliaz's uh, answer. But the rabbis say to him, says, that's not true. Even the non-kosher animal, when it's when it dies and its soul goes to heaven, interesting. I don't know if this literally means that animals have souls that go to heaven. Might just be an expression. Um, and even for non-kosher animals, the flesh does belong to him and he can benefit from it. Because if the owner wants, he can sell it to a non-Jew or feed it to dogs. And so it is still edible food and um, definitely does have financial benefit, even if it's not kosher and he's not eating it. All right, fascinating Mishnah to have a back and forth. It's not so often that you have such a, a detailed argument, um, the reasons for the Tanaim in the Mishnah. So we're always glad when we have that in the Mishnah. Amar Rav Yitzchak Bar Hananya Amar Rav Huna Hamudar Hana Mechavero Mutar Lehasi Lo Lehasi Lo Bito. Okay, we're talking about feeding someone's uh, uh, daughter, sons and daughters, uh, which is allowed. How about marrying them? Okay, so uh, Rav Huna says that even if I made a vow. 
we're going to discuss who is who. All right, but let's uh, assume, let's talk about the groom and the father-in-law. Uh, let's say a groom has a vow that he's not going to have any benefit from this man who has who has a daughter, right? I have no benefit from you. And then he decides he wants to marry that guy's daughter. That's permitted. Okay. Now, have ba to be zera be my askinan. So to be zera is analyzing the statement of Rav Huna and says, what exactly is the case? Who made a vow against whom? Ilema b'shenichse avikala asurin alachatan. If it's the father of the bride who is prohibited to give benefit to the groom. Then what would be the problem? Then uh, what would then it would be a problem because harem wasay lo shivcha lisham mesha because after all here the father of the bride is delivering a maidservant to him. Now it's not such a nice way to talk about a person's daughter and uh, and and wife of this person as a maidservant. But the point is that um, that uh, he is giving his minor daughter here. We're going to see this about a minor daughter uh, to this to this man and yes they will be married um, but part of the marriage is that she will uh, cook and do housework and um, and uh, and uh, 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 pour his pour, pour water for him and um, make his bed and things like that and so this is definitely is a benefit uh, that the father of the bride is giving to the groom so how could you say that this is permitted so it can't be that the vow is that way must be the other way around that the father of the bride is not permitted by a vow to receive benefit from the from the groom um okay so and so even though he can't receive benefit still he's permitted to give his daughter over so he can't receive benefit but he can give benefit so fine then that then the statement of Rav Huna makes sense but well, we have a question about that also because Gedolami Zo Amru Rav Huna, if that's really what he's teaching, then that's a very uh, simple law because we have an even greater chidush in our Mishnah where we say Zan et Ishtovet Banav Vaf Api Shehu Chayab Bim Zonotan Vat Amat Mutal Asi Lo Bito. And our Mishnah, uh, Mishnah taught us that this man, let's call him the groom. Let's say they're not getting married, so this man can even if he wants. Give food to the other guy, the father of the bride, we'll call him, even though in this case they're not getting married. If he wants, he can even give food to his wife and to his sons or daughters. Um, and that's even if they're not getting married. And then in that, in that case, the father has to feed his own daughter. He's responsible to feed his daughter. But if this guy comes and gives the daughter food, that's permitted. So if that's permitted, even when the father has a responsibility to feed his daughter, all the more so, wouldn't it be obvious that if this groom here comes and takes that daughter as a wife, in which case the father no longer has responsibility to feed his wife, to feed his daughter, um, and he and then then uh, and then he's he, well then this groom is giving her food all the more so that would be permitted right so in both of these cases it's the um, the that father of the bride who has a prohibition of receiving benefit and yet he can even take food for his daughter certainly he the this groom can give free, feed his daughter. Uh, when the groom takes her for a wife, when it's not, not even the father's responsibility. So you wouldn't even have to say that, right? It would be totally obvious, uh, uh, Rav Huna, if that's what Rav Huna meant, right? He wouldn't have to say that because it's even simpler case in our Mishnah. So that can't be what Rav Huna meant either. So we say, say instead, Le'olam b'shenichse avikala asurin al hechatan o v'bito bogeret umidata. So we'll go back to the first uh, answer, which is that the groom is not allowed to receive benefit from the father of the bride. And that what you asked, wait a second, but now the groom is receiving a maidservant. He doesn't mean literally a maidservant. He means even better than a maidservant, right? A wife does lots of things around the house, and she's a wife. So, and she, and she, you know, she does so, uh, uh, so many other things, um, bears children, and so on. So, all the more so, um, okay, so in fact, we're talking about that, and, uh, and that what you asked, oh, isn't the father of the bride giving over his daughter, which has uh, the benefits of a maidservant plus more? No, we're, that's okay, because we're talking not about a minor girl. If it's a minor, then the father has full rights to decide what his minor daughter is going to do, so he is actually giving 
the daughter to the groom. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about a grown woman, an adult, and she decides on her own uh, to uh, go and marry this guy. So it's not that the father is giving her over. She can decide on herself, <clears throat> by herself. She has to be with her consent. She has to agree to marry this guy. And so that's why it's not, um, there's, there's no, there's no, it's not a violation of the vow. Um, so it'll be similar to what we said before, right? A person can give food to someone's family members because it's not directly to them. And here also, he's not dependent on the father giving the daughter because she's not a minor, but the daughter says, yeah, I, I want to, herself decides that she wants to marry this groom. And so it does not violate the vow. Good. Now we just spent a while figuring that out ourselves, but in fact, we have a braita that says this explicitly. If there is a, a vow against uh, against receiving benefit from someone's friend, uh, meaning if in this case it was to be a groom and a father of the bride, and the groom cannot receive any benefit from the father of the bride, then that father of the bride cannot give his daughter over in marriage to the groom because that would be giving him benefit. So that would be prohibited. That's assuming it's a minor, the way he's actually giving it. But if his daughter is an adult, then that's, that's, oh, that's okay. He can give her off. He can give her off because that is with her consent. So it's really her decision. And, um, and, there, and therefore, right, she's an independent person and she could decide she wants to marry this guy. <clears throat> God. Next, Amar bi Yaakov, Hamadir beno le Talmud Torah, mutal le malot lo chavit shel ma'im, mudalik lo ne lo etaner. Okay, here it's also ambiguous who is making the vow against whom. Let's assume, uh, I think a simple explanation is, a father makes a vow that his son cannot give any benefit to the father. Not because he hates him, but because he loves him, and he wants his son to go and study Torah and concentrate on Torah. So he doesn't want his son to feel obligated that he has to come over, and help out his father and take him to the doctor and take him uh, to the shopping and uh, cook for him and all that. It takes, it's going to take a lot of time for the son. So the father, in order for the son to go and learn, to make sure the son will learn Torah and not feel guilty um, about uh, Kibud Av, the father says, I prohibit um, you to give me any benefit. Okay, so if the father does that, it does work. But even so, the son is permitted to go and uh, fill a barrel of water uh, for his father or light a candle for his father because those are small things, right? It doesn't take a long time just to light a match. And so the son can continue, right? He'll be thinking about Dafyomi, listening to it, even while he's going and fetching a pail of water. It only takes a few minutes and is not a distraction from his Torah learning. Even to roast a small fish, what does it take? All right, 30 seconds to do a quick roasting of some sardines. That also is permitted. That's not considered uh, uh, a significant benefit that would, over, that would violate the vow. And now we're going to generalize this, that anytime there's a vow against one person giving benefit to another, he can still, he can still give him a, a cup of peace. What does this mean? A peace drink? Two interpretations. Um, here in Bavel, they interpret this to mean uh, a, um, a cup of wine that's given to mourners. That was a custom when someone was in mourning, the community and the neighbors and friends would come and give the mourner, we saw in Masechet Ketubot, 10 cups of wine to drink to uh, calm him down from his sorrow. And so this is the general public comes and, do it and does it, whoever, and maybe it's from communal funds, not from personal funds. And so that's permitted because um, even if I, um, uh, I, I have a, 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 a vow that I'm not going to give any benefit to this avail, nevertheless, I'm not giving him direct benefit. This is a communal thing, right? And we, are, we, we always do this, so we share, that's fine. In the West, they said this cost of shalom is actually talking about a cup that one gives to someone leaving the bathhouse. Uh, when, you, when you go to the bathhouse, you sweat a lot, it's really hot, and you can become dehydrated and faint. And so, um, when people leave the bathhouse, there will be, uh, you know, friends that would uh, be there and offer them a, offer them a drink, um, maybe of some water. 
uh, to uh, or, or could be wine, but you know diluted wine to uh, give the to hydrate them. Uh, kind of like when those runners are running in the marathon, everybody gives them uh, cups to drink uh, to help them out. And so this is again not a personal benefit, but a communal benefit, right? The people that would always want to do this nice deed to help out people that are half fainting from the uh, from the bathhouse and give out the give out give them some a free drink. And therefore, that is also permitted. It's not considered a big benefit, an important, a significant benefit, and certainly not a personal one. And so that also is permitted. Velo yazunet behem to. Um, and person, uh, uh, however, if I have a vow against you, I cannot feed your animals, according to Chachamim, uh, both kosher and non-kosher animals. Tanya Yehoshua ish ouza omer, zan avada veshivchotav hakena'anim, velo yazun et behemto ben temea ben tehora. Uh, so Rabbi Yeshua is now elaborating further because Mishnah, Mishnah talked about household uh, members, and family members, and animals. But what about slaves and maidservants? So Yeshua Ish Uza says that a person can, right? Even if I made a vow that I'm not going to give you any benefit, I can, if I want, feed your um, your uh, s- slaves and maidservants who are non- non-Jewish, uh, non-Jewish. Um, because, uh, so I'm helping them out, right? I'm not helping you. Um, uh, just giving them, uh, you know, extra food. Um, and uh, you're responsible for their main um, uh, sustenance. But if I want to give them something extra, so that really doesn't benefit you in any way, not uh, financially. However, I'm not allowed to, but I cannot feed your animals. Okay, why? What's the difference? Because a person's uh, may, slaves and maidservants are made for uh, labor. Um, so by we're not, we're not selling them or uh, you know, eating them they're not there so giving them a little extra fat um, is not helping you financially in any way unlike animals that they're made to be fattened and so if I give extra food to your animals kosher you can eat it non-kosher you can sell it so that's why that gives you a direct financial benefit by giving food to your animals but by giving um, a food to your uh, slaves and maidservants they are independent beings and so they get they they're happy that they get a little extra food and uh, then and uh, there's no no direct benefit to their owner. Baruch Adonai Lodam. Amen ve'amen.